Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. But in the scriptures, we can read the scriptures, and as it says, the, the scriptures are full of wisdom from God. And God has already told us and weaved into things within the scriptures that will actually be related to the end times. And I was going to be looking probably just at the book of Exodus. I'm not necessarily getting any great, I'll, I'll probably be paraphrasing a lot, so you can just have to follow some of it and we can look at that. In biblical typology, um, which is, if you like, Old Testament accounts, historical accounts or stories that are depicting future events. So typology is that you could be reading a story in the book of Exodus, Pharaoh, for instance, in Egypt. But if you were really reading that in guidance by the Spirit of God, you can see a lot of illustrations that that's going to be impacting on the latter days. And we can see that many times. It's like you're being, you're, God has shown us something that's got a, that a lot happened in real time, but it's got a futuristic happening again that's going to take place in the last days. And I've been really looking at that over the last couple of days and just looking into that. And I'm going to bring some little um, points to your attention today. If you wanted to look at the story of Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh is a type of Satan or an antichrist figure. And he holds the people in bondage and refuses to release them. As we went into, as we know, went into Egypt, and um, and then as Pharaoh, if you like, then imprisoned them and sought to destroy them. Egypt is a type of the world, and I think everyone is, we will be familiar with that. Egypt, the Bible talks about being going back to Egypt. It's like it's the world. You going back into the world. God calls us out the world, but Egypt is when we went back to Egypt. It was going back to their old ways. We're going back into that place of the world accounts there. Now, I've got down here that actually we're talking about the great wealth transfer. Well, one of the greatest wealth transfers happened in Egypt all those years ago under Pharaoh. Do you remember the seven years of famine? There was the seven good years and seven bad years. And of course, because of Joseph, the man of God that went down to Egypt, that he was enlightened that there was going to, during the seven bad years, everybody was going to lose everything. And so Egypt, under Pharaoh, um, they gathered all the grain, they protected this, they got a big massive barn full of all, full of all of the grain. So when the seven bad years came, everybody was forced to go to Egypt, amen? They had to go to Egypt for your bread or you would die, bottom line is. So right across the Middle East, whether it was a worldwide famine for seven years, it's not too sure, but over that period of time, hence the reason Israel themselves, the nation, which only 70 plus people actually had to go down into Egypt at that particular time. And for those seven years, it says the, the whole wealth, Pharaoh ended up taking all the money, all the livestock, and all the land. He owned everything. Because it was so severe year after the year, they took all the money, and then they took all the livestock, until they had nothing left but themselves. And he says, look, we're dying here. You might as well, we'll be, we'll, be your slave. we'll be your servants, and our land will be your land. And it says here, he took everything. So the greatest wealth transfer would happen back there in Egypt because he, he had all the money, hallelujah, and everybody lost everything during that particular time. Made Pharaoh very, very powerful. He was a very, very powerful man. He was worshipped as a god, and um, the son of Ra, which would be the son, and, um, and that's how the people seen him. They seen him as a godlike figure. Interestingly enough, I was just listening to the radio, and I forget the name of the Indian, the Indian president at this moment in time, but he suggested on the radio this morning that he, he feels he is a unique person, born at a deliberate time, and the gods are shining upon him just now. Just a little article I heard on the radio. And um, he's not quite saying that he wasn't born in the natural way, but he's suggesting that. Well, you've got Yon Kim out there in um, North Korea. He calls himself a little demigod and gives him that kind of aspect where people actually worship in North Korea, worship this man. We know that Hitler claimed to be a kind of godlike figure as well. Not that, you know, when you've seen that Hail Hitler and everybody, you know, he, he, he promoted himself as a great savior. And we can see that through the Roman world. We can see that through the Greek world. But it was interesting listening to that with this man from India at this moment in time, trying to give himself this kind of credit there as well. So Pharaoh controlled all things. Hallelujah. And he grew very, very powerful. But we know that the Israelites went into Egypt, and while they went to Egypt the first time, they were blessed. They were blessed out of their socks because Joseph brought them in. They went to a place called Goshen, 
It was the best place in Egypt to live. And it says they prospered, they multiplied, and they were blessed. When they went into Egypt, they were blessed. They were living in the, back, the best part of town. And then um, because Joseph, their brother, um, took care of them, and it says they multiplied and they became exceedingly great and wealthy at that particular time. But then as we read the next the story, at the very beginning, it says here, but a new king came to power. So Joseph died. And the, the Pharaoh died, and then another Pharaoh came to power somewhere down the line, and it says, but he began to persecute them. It's amazing how turn of events, isn't it? Uh, how things can change just overnight sometimes when you can get a change of government or a change of king or a change of circumstances. At one moment, you might be doing great, and then just at a click of the fingers, everything can change. And so this new Pharaoh came to power, a new king, and it says he became very shall we say, concerned about the Israelites because there were so many of them. There was, there was, there, you know, and he says, we need to deal with them shrewdly. We need to deal with these people. They could become a problem for us. If we don't deal with them just now, look at them, there's so many of them. They could turn against us and go to our enemies. He says, we need to do something just now. And so he began to persecute them, hallelujah, and he afflicted them. And the more that he did that, the more they multiplied. It's not amazing. There's a principle that isn't it. The more we persecuted them, the more the more they try to, you know, the, the, you know, to attack them and afflict them, the more they multiplied. Do you know that that's a principle of that? You know, when you see when you read about the early stages of the church, the more the Romans tried to destroy them, the more they grew. <laughs> so you know, and even today, the underground church, the more that they try and destroy them, they seem to just keep growing. China's got that problem, and China would like to try and stamp them out, but the church has grown exponentially in China, if you go with their figures, but there's, I mean, there's a billion plus in them. Anyway, isn't there? But, there, but they keep growing. And there's, there seems to be a principle that, you know, Jesus says, that, you know, the, the kingdom of God will go from strength to strength. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall never be able to Amen. prevail. Amen. And that's the principle of God. And sometimes as well, that principle could be taken individually. You ever sometimes you go through a point where it's just you're getting persecuted and you get persecuted and you you know and you don't realise actually you're actually becoming stronger, although it doesn't feel like that. It feels as if you're wrecked. But in the economy of God, actually you're becoming stronger and you're growing in your faith. Faith has to be tested, the Bible says. James tells us that, Peter tells us that. Think it, praise God when all hell breaks loose in your life. For you know your faith is being is, is being tested. It's getting into the fire. And, and it's like, you know, you ever feel that praising God when all hell's breaking loose about your life and you're in dire straits, whether it's health-wise, whether it's financially, whether it's in that, you know, whatever, physically? Do you ever feel that way? You just, you just, and you, and you think, what do you mean, God, you've been glorified here? I'm dying. I mean, I'm struggling just to keep afloat. And God's okay, I've got everything under control. And um, you're actually growing. But though you never fully realize that until you get over the other side and then you say, I mean, I look back over my life, 38 years, I'm looking back and I can see some terrible periods. I'm not going to hang my dirty washing out here for you and don't, don't worry, I'm not, I've not been running about murdering people, I might add, or anything else. But I can still see periods in my life that I would like to erase or, or periods there over that long course. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And yet, when I look back now, I would think, I would hate to go through that period of time again, but I know that period of time was beneficial for me. Times of great financial stress to the point, you know, I mean, literally going down the side of couches, seeking out money. And it wasn't just for a week or two weeks, it was prolonged. Feeling just really struggling. If I could put a tenner into my wee van when I was working for myself, I, you know, I mean, I was happy just to put fuel in the van because I was struggling in just a, in so many other areas and just all the complications. And then you get over the other side of it. I'm sitting my wee back door the other day there and this lovely new furniture we've got and God blessed us with that. And, um, and I thought, God, I'm blessed. But you only know when you're blessed when you know what you've, when you've you know, the things when you've came through difficulties. You'll never know what it's like to be blessed until you know what it's like to went through the fire and went through difficulties. Then when good times come, you can say, Father, thank you. We know what it's like to have went through difficulties. Then we can really enjoy the times that, when that can come. Or maybe even through a period of sickness and illness and then you get the victory and you come through the other side. I want to tell you this, that's, that's a wonderful feeling. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So the more they afflicted them, the more they, they multiplied in them. And, and this really was upsetting, you know, Pharaoh to the point he says, let's kill them, other boys. Do you see his thinking? So when any boy gave, he gave the order, 
uh, to the, the midwives. Whenever a, if a, if a, when a child is born, if it's a boy, then kill the boy. And if it's a girl, let her live. Well, effectively, you know, what we can see is we see, we see the great Satan working through the earthly counterpart, don't we? Because he knew there was a savior of the world who was coming. And he was coming through the Jewish nation. Guys, get over it. Jesus is a Jew. Amen. And so he thought, right, let me kill all the boys. D job done and dusted. This savior will not come. And so he knew the time of God's deliverance was probably coming now. And, you know, he knew there was something brewing. And he says, we need to deal with this just now. Hallelujah. But God rescued the boys. And hey, presto, Moses was born. Glory to God. Moses, a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So we can see as types of Antichrist, we see types of Messiahs as well. And Moses was a great shadow and type of the great deliverer who was coming to rescue his people. And we can see that there in Moses. Hallelujah. Egypt was airtight. Not only had the Israelites become slaves in Egypt, but it was airtight, there was no way out. And he was not letting them go. He was keeping them there. Because he knew God has got a plan and purpose for this people and they, and they didn't want him to get into the promised land. Because don't forget, when God ever makes a covenant, that's going to be like Satan will do everything he can to attack that covenant. That people, they're a covenant people and the land is a covenant land as well. That land is covenanted to Israel. That's why all hell is breaking loose at this moment in time is to keep the land from Israel. And they've done a great job for it. And even when they did get their land, they only got a portion of the land because Winston Churchill or the British government failed and the British mandate, Balfour Declaration, to give them the whole land, they started then appeasing other people and under pressure from the Arabs and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the Islamic nations. They were put under a lot of pressure and so they, 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 they reneged on it and then eventually even actually, they didn't even vote for it in the 1947 um, UN Council, you know, vote. Britain abstained. How sad was that? Because, you know, because they were exasperated with the people but God had other plans. But Israel's only got a fraction of that land. Hallelujah. And we can see these other things woven into it. That's why all hell's breaking around this, around this land. Because the land is very important. Just as the people of God are important, which is Israel. But also that land is very, very important. That's why there's so much activity and so much, you know, um, fighting over it. And been over the centuries, even to this day in which we find ourselves. So it's airtight. They were slaves. But they became, they developed a slave mentality. A slave mentality is when you just accept your law, you just accept your, you know, that that's, you grew up under that, that was acceptable. You were, you, you were the servants or you were, the, you were enslaved to the masters. They treated you badly and you just accepted that. You just expected that. That was, that was you know, and you, you wouldn't want to fight against it. You, you developed a slave mentality. Do you know, sometimes that's something we need to fight against as well because sometimes we can just become so accustomed to your circumstances. Oh, I'm just, that's, just, that's just the way it is. Well, that might have been okay when we weren't in Christ, but now that we're in Christ, we need to actually think, hang on a sec here. Things need to change. Hallelujah. Things need to change. Glory to God. Because no longer is the devil ruling over my life. Now, Jesus Christ is ruling over my life. Hallelujah. And we need to begin to look up and just start to, to decree and say, I can do far things far better than I've ever done them before. Why? Because God's in my life. And I'm an example of that. And we won't get into that. Let's, we'll keep that for another time. Just a hopeless case that I was. So rather than fighting back, they accepted their, ca uh, kept their captivity and abuse from their torturers. I mean, how sad that is, isn't it? When you could have just, you know, you just, you just accept your lot rather than rising up. And, being, and, and begin to fight. When there were so many of them, they could easily have rose up and, and challenged um, the, the, the Egyptians of their day. But the time of deliverance had come, glory to God. For God had already been working on and raising up a deliverer. This is our prayers. If you come to the, the, any of the kind of prayer meetings we got on here in the morning, and it's my prayer for Scotland, because I believe Scotland is in a place of captivity. I believe the enemy has overran our nation. Our walls that used to protect us when we were once known as the land of the book and the land of the Bible. We were a protected nation. Do you know why? Because we honored God. Hallelujah. But that's gone now. The enemy over, has overtaken us. Our nation now has been swamped by dark demonic powers. Hallelujah. Which is virtually destroying our nation. Shall we say, you know, scripturally. And our, 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 our heritage that we once had, that we were proud of now. They say we're a godless nation. 
I don't know about you, but that makes me sad inside, you know, of, of Scotland. Or a, do you know, we're a laughing stock to the rest of the world and people are looking at us, you know, and you, you look at our present leader, John Sweeney, who calls himself a Christian, but, uh, you know, I would, I, would, I, would beg to, I would beg to disagree with some of his policies that he says that he is promoting. He promotes transgenderism, he, he promotes LGBT and every, all these issues. He promotes all of these things and he, he, you know, he's, he's, he's putting his hands up and says, yes, I, I agree with all of that. Well, how can you say you're a Christian yet you can agree with all of that? Then I would find that difficult, you know, and uh, you know, say, well, it's politics. Well, it's not politics because, I mean, I, I, I've, had, I've, had words to, I've had words to speak to um, any of them who call them and kill Christians. My first allegiance to this book, not to the, not to the party's constitution. Our first allegiance should be this book. That's where our first allegiance should be before then, whatever other field that we should be in. That's where we should be first of all accountable to and not the party politics that we belong to. So we can see here that deliverance now is coming. God, he was unable to kill the boys and there's a little special boy born, Moses. And then God is, takes him into, and, and the very persons he's, he's actually seeking to kill he puts him into Pharaoh's house and he gets trained in all the wisdom of the, of the Egyptians. Could have been raised up a prince within Egypt. We know then because he kind of jumped the gun a little bit on the deliverance side, thought that he was going to rescue Israel and killed an Egyptian and all backfired. He's 40 years in the wilderness until the time came, burning bush experience, and God sends him back to Egypt with a commission. Tell him, Pharaoh, to let my people go. Hallelujah. And so here we see here, Moses now comes after having that expression and he's, he's told again and, and the, the message is to Pharaoh, let my people go. Hallelujah. They want to do, take a three day journey into the wilderness and Pharaoh says, well, that's not, that's not going to happen. I ain't going to let anybody go. And who is this God? I don't know your God. We've got lots of gods in Egypt. Your God? I don't even know this God. I've taken nothing to do with you. And um, but I like the way God says something, let my people go or else. <laughs> that's the difference with God, isn't it? Let my people go or else. I'm going to sort you out. Amen. And the whole 10 plagues that God is now going to smash Egypt with and totally break them and smash them is actually got so much more that he's actually dealing in the spiritual realm. This is, every one of those plagues actually is dealing with a spiritual God over Egypt because Egypt had lots of gods. And so you would see every single one of them has actually got a spiritual implication to the gods that's ruling over Egypt, but also is going to be dealing with Egypt itself. And we'll just bring out a couple of wee points here. Because I love the way, you know, when God begins to deal with them. But it's the, it's the fourth plague that God begins to kick in. And Pharaoh says, well, I'm not interested. All right, so the Nile's turned blood, so what? And uh, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and he, and he even puts up with the frogs. I mean, I don't like frogs at the best of time, you know. But, you know, but can you imagine frogs everywhere? But it's the flies. And then there was the lice, but then there's the flies. And it's the flies that get them. It's the flies. Swarms them, swarms of flies. Just hundreds of them. Yeah. I mean, we're coming in the summer. Do you ever get those days you're walking along the braes nice and, and, and all these flies are all flying over you? And it's, you start to outrun them, but they just seem to kind of constantly. In fact, in the morning, prayer, I mean, we've got one fly in the room next door and it's bothering us. We're all bugged. It's like, it just seems to fly over to me and bug me. I'm trying to read and it's buzzing around about my ears. And it's like, I'm just missing it. I'm missing it. And I think we've all had a go at trying to get it. I like, oh, get that thing. All the, every morning, one fly and it's bugging us. It's really annoying me. Could you imagine just swarms and swarms and swarms of flies? But God says, but I'm going to make a difference in this plague, the fourth plague. He says, there'll be no flies going into Goshen, where my people are. I mean, that's miraculous. I mean, Pharaoh must have been standing there. But, I mean, you ever get that when it's the, the rain, that it's raining here and then it stops and you can be standing there like that and it's, the rain stops here, but you can uh, get a foot and it's dry. And you get a, you know. I think I did it once. So it's a little bit, could you imagine what's happening here? This is just the hand of God. In fact, when it came to the lice, Pharaoh's musicians, uh, physicians, um, they, be, they basically, they, they, they says, no, this is the finger of God, but Pharaoh was still hardened within himself because he's spiritually motivated. There was no way he was letting the people go. But the flies got to him. And he says, okay, 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 okay. When I came in, he says, okay, you can sacrifice to your God, but do it in the land. Just do it here. You can, do it, you can do it in Egypt. You don't need to go into the wilderness, for goodness sake. Just sacrifice your God here. And Moses said, that's impossible for us. To, you know, I mean, says, this is abhorrent for your people. They would, they would be abhorred with this. And Moses is making that kind of a, a statement to him. Hallelujah. You cannot sacrifice in the land. Now, what is it the Bible says in a couple of points? It says, come ye out of the world and be ye different. 
very difficult to try and be the Christian when you're still very much in the world. That's why the Bible says, come you out of the world and be different. There's another place, although we're in the world, but we're not in the world. Amen. So although I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. So we're in the world, but we're not of the world. That kind of, you know, that kind of, you, some people think you must be losing your mind, don't you? What, what do you mean you're in the world, but you're not in the world? You're standing in front of me. Although I'm living in it, but I'm so, so, I can be so different. I, I'm in it, but I'm not in it. Hallelujah, because I belong to another kingdom. Do you know we're already in the kingdom of God? We're not waiting to be in the kingdom of God. Jesus says that in that great prayer to the Father in John 17, isn't it? It says, Father, it says, they've accepted my word. They are no longer of this world. Neither have I in the world, neither are they of the world. Why? Because I believed your word. Amen. But Father, protect them while they're still in the world. So though we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Hallelujah. But God is sustaining us in the world. I belong to another world. So sacrifice in the land. Hallelujah. I would say that's probably one of the biggest problems in the church today is some people, we never leave Egypt. We're quite happy to just to, we're, we're, you know, go to church and we can have that experience, but the world still get too much of a hold of me. So I'm still, I've never really left the world, do you know what I mean? So, and what does that look like? And I'm going to leave that for every individual to, to work that one out for yourself, uh, you know, but you have to work that one out for yourself. And I want to tell you this, it's, very, it's, it's virtually impossible to really, to sacrifice unto the Lord and to, while you're still camped in the world. And you'll struggle to really break free into that place where God wants you to be because you've never really left the world. And of course, when Moses complained and he says, okay, he says, okay, sacrifice. And they go in the desert and sacrifice. But don't go too far. But don't go too far. Okay, go into the wilderness, but, but don't go too far. Did you ever get that? I was talking to the guy, Kevin, last night. I went, Kevin, we were talking. He was listening to me. And Jennifer, Jennifer's a lovely lady. And you could see Jennifer, she was a bit nervous. She was sitting next to us and she was a wee bit nervous because she could see me talking to him. And I just says to him at the end, I says, Kevin, I'm a very dangerous man. Do you know that? <laughs> I say, see when, when people, like, usually the wife or the husband's looking there and I'm talking to the other person, they're like, they, they get a bit nervous. And like, oh, he's talking to him, he's talking to him. I mean, I, I, I've, I've, I've had the point, guys, where, where I know some guys would have liked to came and kicked, kicked, kicked my teeth in. I'd get very angry with me because all of a sudden, say, their wife started to come to church and then all of a sudden the wife begins to change. All of a sudden now the gospel starts to impact her life. All of a sudden now she begins to, she, she changes. She's not the woman that she once was. And the husband goes, what the hell have you done to my wife? I said, I've not done anything to you. What have you done to my wife, mate? You know, it's says, my wife, what are you saying to her? You're brainwashing her and all the rest. And I would have to turn around and say, it's nothing to do me, it's God. <laughs> and that's what it can be. Because that's when they know that, when, when you really, and that's what I say to Kevin, I says, Kevin, when we see when you really embrace this, when you really embrace this, I says, this will totally and utterly change you, Kevin. It will totally change you. It will totally and utterly spoil you. I've seen that happen with some people in here before, but now they've caved in and they've went back. But the, the, their wives were very unhappy because all of a sudden she couldn't cope with this. They can't cope with it. When one person begins to change, another person doesn't change, it becomes very difficult now because well, we used to go to the clubs together, we used to do this together, we used to do that, and all of a sudden it's like, no, I'm going to prayer meetings. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing that now. And, and, and that change now becomes now massive friction. So people just say, don't, don't get too excited, just calm down a wee bit. I and mean, I first get to say, people says, come on, relax, relax. You're taking that a wee bit, oh, you're getting a wee bit OTT. Calm down, you know, just settle down a little bit. Don't be, you don't need to be too kind of radical. Hallelujah. And they try and, they try and kind of restrain you. Just hold back a bit, you know. You don't need to, you know. And, and do you know something? That's said the enemy. The enemy will do everything he can. He maybe was unable to get you, stop you getting saved. But he's going to be hanging on to your, your shirt tail. Keeping you back and holding you back. Because he doesn't want you getting too deep into this. So he'll do everything to restrain you and he's a master of doing that. You know, well, you know so you compromise. You know, I'm compromised, so oh, come on, you can do this and you can do that. Don't worry about it. I mean, I don't want to be too hard and fast. I, I could pick out a couple of things, and, but I won't. I won't anyway. And um, just wee things that we hang on to which can become negative. I mean, and you know that you know deep down within you when God is asking you to give something up. So he tries to restrain you. Know, don't, you don't need to go to all the prayer meetings and you don't need to do this and you don't need to do that. Come on, just relax. You, you know, you can, you can chill out a little bit. And um, in the early days, I really, I just, I just flung myself into the kingdom of God, you know. 
because I was so exasperated in my the wasted lives, just sitting about and smoking hash and talking a load of mumble jumble, drinking too much and taking other stuff and running about and getting nowhere fast. And, you know, the, my life was pathetic. And, I, and I'll say that to you. My life was pathetic, really, utterly pathetic. I was going nowhere fast and I was so discouraged within myself. I'd messed up my young life. Hallelujah. But glory to God, when God came in, I went, here, I've got my second chance. I always said that, you know, when it's a born again experience, I was all, I wish I had a second chance at life. I wish, I wish, I wish I could go back and change things. And then I get saved and I went, I've got my second chance. And I'm going to make the best of it this time. I'm not going to mess it up. You know, and who knows when I stand before the Lord in that day and, you know, and say one thing and another. Well, that would be that would be decided, but but glory to God. So first of all, he says, okay, go and sacrifice, but don't go too far. And that's how the enemy would say that. And then after a few more plagues, Lord smashing them again. He says, okay, you can go, but just the men. Leave your women and your children. Use men. That's what you want. You can go. Just you just go and worship the Lord, but just leave your women and your kids behind. You're only going into the desert for three days fast, but leave your wife and your kids and your livestock. And of course, Moses says, that can't be done, no. We're all gone. I've got down here, partial obedience is actually disobedience. Nick says, okay, we'll go. That's okay, we'll go. Well, that's, 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 that's a good deal. We'll go. We can always come back for women and children. When the Lord says, you've got to go the whole way, partial obedience, my friends, just doesn't cut it. Actually, partial obedience is actually disobedience. Do you remember that with Saul? And, um, and, and Samuel comes and rebukes him. He was given a command, get and destroy the Amalekites, everything, men, women, children, kill a lot of them and their animals. And then when, you know, when Samuel went to visit Saul, he, Saul had spared the best of the livestock, all the, all the good things. He killed all the bad things, but he kept the good things and he allowed King ah Ahag to live. I mean, Samuel exposed him and I would, in fact I'll read that just so that we we can be there just one Samuel let me just you don't have to turn there but you can if you want one Samuel 15 and 22 says this so Samuel said to him as the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams for rebellion is sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is idolatry iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of God, he also has rejected you from being king. Oh, yeah. But when Saul challenged Samuel, but Samuel said, but I did obey God. I did, I did everything that God told me to do, but I, I, I didn't quite kill all the good things, but he, he was able to bring an excuse for that. And he was <coughs> rebuked because of that. So we can see here, guys, there's always a chance of making that kind of compromise, isn't it? Like Saul, justifying our actions when we know deep down that God has called us to go the extra mile. And then the fourth point then being, then again, he, he totally ignores them. And it says, then he says, okay, all of you may go, but leave your livestock. You know, the devil's a master negotiator. <laughs> okay, right, you can go and your wife and your kids can go. All of you, she can go, but leave your livestock. Well, the livestock was, that was, that was your money. That was your bread and butter. You know, that was like, leave your livestock. How could you sacrifice to God if you didn't have any animals to sacrifice to them? And what were you going to eat if you're going to leave all your animals? So you could have made a rash decision and not really given it adequate thought. You ever did that? Oh, hey, look, I've got two hands up. You ever sometimes under pressure? You go, oh, and you make it right, okay. And you know deep down it's not the right decision, but you've done it just under the pressure of the moment. And then the consequences further down the line, like that. that was not a very good decision I'd be there. <laughs> but under pressure. We could probably look at the modern state of Israel today when they were put under pressure, Ariel Sharon, and they gave away Gaza. And they says, okay, land for peace. Okay, okay, that, anything. They just do. And they were under pressure by the Americans. I think it was one of the Bushes at that particular time. And the world was putting pressure on them, land for peace. Okay, okay, here, okay. And they gave away that portion of the land. And guess what? It's come back to haunt them to this day. It's come back and it haunted them. Within a short period of time, they made a bad decision and they looked back in over the course and it's hindsight. You know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? You ever look, you make a decision, you look back and go like, why well, did we ever sign ourselves up to all this debt? You know, but maybe just in a moment of time. When you're under pressure sometimes, it's so easy just to, you know, to, to jump into a situation. I've been there in the past, take it alone and, and it comes back and it bites you and it's okay short term, but long term, no, nah, it didn't, it wasn't the best move. 
But glory to God. So then just leave the livestock. Well, that would have hindered them badly. They wouldn't have been able to sacrifice to the Lord. And so basically, they'd have crippled them. They wouldn't, they'd have, they wouldn't, they'd have, they'd have, they'd have been able to sac- bring their sacrifices. And they would have been struggling even to eat their food. And then, of course, we know the last plague was with the death of the firstborn. And God says that. And he says, after this one, he will let you go. Amen. So Moses stuck to his gun. He says, no, we will not leave one, you know, one, one iota of our belongings. Everything is coming with us. And, um, and so after the, the last plague, they stood, fa- they stood fast to the very end. And then Pharaoh called him in. And this is what Pharaoh says to him. Leave immediately. Take everything and go quickly. <laughs> you know, when we allow God to fight our battles, brethren, I want to tell you this. He knows how to fight and he knows how to deal with the devil. Because the devil is a liar, a thief, and a destroyer. And he will destroy us. He will come against us. And he's sitting out there. And so when we stand firm with the Lord and look to God as our great deliverer, and it says Israel left Egypt and they left immediately with everything. In fact, not just with everything. They left, they plundered the Egyptians. They left with the Egyptians or the money of the Egyptians. God says, you know, I will, you, I will cause you to plunder the Egyptians. And so when they left Egypt, the Bible, the Bible tells us, it says, ask your neighbors, ask the Egyptians, give me your money. <laughs> give, give me some, give me something. And it says, and the Egyptians were all full of fear of them. And it says, and the Egyptians gave them everything that they wanted to. And it says, so Israel plundered their enemies and they left victoriously. There's a proverb and it says this, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. The wealth of the world is stored up for the righteous. Do you know, I was talking about, and I'm going to finish here, just to, trying to finish an encouraging note. The greatest wealth transfer ever is still before us. We read about that one, and I just brought the one out, because you can read that, actually, this modern day great wealth transfer because of the COVID disaster, but you could look at other ones down through history. But the greatest one was the way back in Egypt when he took everything. He owned everything. The people were enslaved to him. But the greatest one is still to come. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, see all the wealth of this world, see all the, see, see all the, 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 the blessings of this world. Do you know what? It's coming to us who are in Christ Jesus. The wicked have given their lives for it. Tooth and nail has corrupted them. They've sold their souls for money, whether it's in the rock business. They literally do sell their souls to Satan, you know. They've sold everything for money, 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 because money equates to power. The Bill Gates of this life or the Elon Musks, whoever they might be, they think they've got everything. They think they've got everything in such an abundance and they think they're the most powerful people. They own all the land. They own, they own all this land. I tell you this, when Jesus comes back, hallelujah, Everything is now going to be given to us, the saints of God. We will rule this world under Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Everything is coming to us. God has given the kingdom of God to his saints who are in Christ Jesus. Praise God. We have a glorious future, brothers and sisters, as we move into these latter days. And people say, who knows how far we're into it? How how close are we to the line? Let us keep our eyes fixed, hallelujah, on heaven. Brethren, can I encourage all of us today, we are living in days where it can just suck the life out of you. Do, do you know that expression? Do you ever feel as if I'm just, my life, I just feel as if I'm getting my life sucked out of me and we're talking about our spiritual lives at times. Let us just make sure we take stock, just step back sometimes, even when you're in the middle of the heat. Just take a wee step back sometimes and catch your breath. Just spend a lot of time with the Lord and then just go, right, okay, and I'm going to go back into it again. Hallelujah. I, I, I like to, I liken it to this, and I think I shared it with someone, and maybe there's someone's in the room tonight will remember it. I says, you know, because they do a lot of miles under, a lot of pressures, or driving up and down, or meetings, meetings, meetings. I says, you know what you need to do? Just, just sometimes pull into a lay-by. Just get up the road, just pull in. Just take 10 minutes. Spend a wee bit of time in prayer. Maybe bring the word of God to have a wee reading. Just say, Father, thank you. (sighs) Help me now as I carry on the rest of my business and then move on. It's a little bit, you know, in the the Grand Prix, you get the pit stops, don't you? (laughs) Blink and your wheels are going. (laughs) And I'm back on the road again, ready for the journey. Let us proactively have these little pit stops. And that's what Sundays are really far. There are places where we can come. We should be fresh, get built up, inspired, give God glory. I'm ready now to face the week. That's why Sunday was important. Hallelujah. I know we can't be always there, but we, whether we're able to make church, we don't, but we can still spend that time with the Lord. We could be wherever. 
We revive ourselves, we refresh ourselves, hallelujah. We focus on what? The finishing line, brethren. The finishing line. Our salvation is nearer now than what it was at first. All the signs are here that we are pushing towards that. And this kingdom of this world in which we, we, we have to work in it. You know, we, 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 we live in it, we breathe air. We eat fish. That's going to come to a point now when it's finished. It's finished. Hallelujah. And the kingdom of God will be here. It is here, but it's not here. Does that make sense? Well, it is here because it's in here. But the day is coming when it's coming here. It's coming here. And God's going to deal with the wicked. And all that wealth and everything that they've tooth and nail lied and schemed and cheated and murdered and all the things that they're doing for it is going to be stripped from them. And they're going to be banished into a terrible place. And we who have stood faithful, the poor, the blind, the lame, we are going to rejoice. We are going to be clothed in our new bodies. Hallelujah. Talking to Roland, we were getting excited about it. We share some, some, some things there and I think, what does that look like, you know? What does it look like to know we are, we are going to be as he was? We're going to have spiritual bodies and we've got a job to do. Hallelujah upon this earth. Actually, I think it's uh, Roland and I agree with Roland. I think we're going to become like the angels. So we've got a part to play in this earth, but we will, able to, we will be able to go through into the realm and get into heaven and back and forth. Don't think we're all going to go and live in the natural, living in Jerusalem, friends. Behave yourselves. Jerusalem can contain all the, all the born again Christians and everybody that's believing the Lord. No, we, well, we will be supernaturally transformed. The world is going to carry on as normal for a thousand years. People are going to be living in the old order, marrying and giving in marriage. They will be still living in the temporal. We will be, we will be exalted into our heavenly bodies for that thousand years. Glory to God. And I believe we will be like the angels. We'll be able to come to and fro in between heaven and coming back again. And Jesus will give us charge depending on how well we have done for him. Friends, there's a great future waiting for us. Let's keep our eye on that timeline. It's nearer now than it ever was. Let's not be frustrated when we see the times of becoming evil and they're going to become far more wickeder. Guys, let's not kid ourselves on. There's not going to be any great days until the coming of the Lord. The days are going to become very dark. They're going to become very difficult. But glory to God, if God's for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. And he's going to stand with us. And if somebody wanted to come up and put a bullet through my head, I would just say, hallelujah, glory to God. And friends, I'll see you on the other side. Amen. I'm going to go and be my Savior who I have served. That is 100% within me. Instant death, instant glory. That is the great hope of the Christian faith. Let us keep our ourselves focused on that great hope friends it will keep you let's keep ourselves energized let's remember again if you read through the book of exodus i believe that is shown as something the typology there we're going to see that coming again we're going to see a man is going to grow up a new king is going to come onto the scene of this earth like pharaoh a new king and he's going to begin to persecute all those predominantly christians and jews predominantly and he is going to attack everything and anything and everything's going to change. Hallelujah. But he's only been going to be able to do it for three and a half years. Forget the seven years. Three and a half years, okay? He's going to be given power to rule this world. And then Jesus is going to come at the end of it. And he's going to be dealt with. Glory to God. Amen. Father, I just pray, Lord, today, Lord, that you will strengthen us. I pray, Lord God, Father, that you will help us. I pray today, Lord God, Father, for anybody that might be feeling weak and feel as if, Lord God, that they have, Father, compromised themselves, I pray today, Father, that you will strengthen them by the strength of Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord God, by the strength of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, you will reinforce us, Lord God, Father, and Lord God, Father, Lord, encourage us and inspire us today, Lord, that, Lord, that you are the one who looks after us. May your blessing now be upon us all, I pray, Father, in Jesus' great name. Amen. And amen. The Lord bless you. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.